Welcome, everyone. Um, we are very happy to have Nat Trask today. Um, I'm very excited for this talk because it, at least parts of it are about a question that I've um, been talking about for the last two years with lots of people, so I don't have an answer, but Nat hopefully has, which is that um, <laughs> we have usually quite low accuracies uh, when we're trying to model numerical uh, scientific problems. And maybe we'll hear an answer of how one can solve this. I don't want to take anything away from your motivation. So um, please just uh, go ahead and take over. Great. Thanks, Philip. It's a real pleasure to be here. And um, the, this seems like a really fantastic uh, seminar series. So, uh, so I'll get right into it. Um, so first off, I'd like to contrast scientific machine learning to traditional machine learning. So in traditional machine learning, you're doing things like classification, image or video processing, natural language processing, and so on. And for each one of those tasks, there are kind of off the shelf traditional machine learning tools which have been tailor made or crafted for each one of these tasks. So of course, like convolutional networks are great for doing image classification, LSTMs and, and things like that are great for handling time series and, and so on. And so um, in many of these scenarios, getting a lot of accuracy out of one of these models is actually maybe not a great thing um, because that leads to overfitting and so on. And you're much more interested in, for example, for classification, partic uh, partitioning space up neatly, right? So, so we're interested in scientific machine learning, which is broadly um, kind of a buzzword that's come up to mean applying these kind of tools towards science and engineering tasks. And for these settings, it's, it's uh, the problems themselves are very different and they have very different requirements. So for example, when we're handling geometries, our geometries are much more complex. The boundaries of these geometries are very important. For example, when you're solving PDEs and boundary value problems, it's not just kind of getting things right as a whole and kind of discovering small features or fingerprints of, of a problem. Um, but you actually really need to handle this stuff very precisely. And the other issue is that our data is typically extremely small, right? So we're not Google or Facebook. We don't have access to massive amounts of data. Um, one, in, one application I'll talk about is the Z machine at Sandia, which is a pulse power fusion device. So a single experiment on this device can cost $100,000. And so the idea that, you know, you could just appeal to a large data limit and universal approximation uh, kind of breaks down for us. So our tasks are different, right? We're doing, we're looking for constitutive models, uh, PDE based physics models, dynamical systems, and so on. And for us, we have a different set of traditional tools. So uh, designing approximation spaces, using variational principles and taking advantage of geometric and algebraic structure. So the, the objective for all of the work that's been coming out of our group is that we'd like to fold some of these traditional modeling and simulation tools into traditional machine learning tools. So really come up with a hybrid of these things. So that way we can, we can give some guarantees which are necessary in these kind of high consequence science and engineering settings. Um, so within the community, there's kind of been this spectrum of physics and form machine learning that's emerged. So uh, many of you are probably well aware of this three or four years ago, maybe once a lot of the excitement came out, TensorFlow was becoming very mainstream. People were trying to throw, for example, their massive PDE solvers into TensorFlow and see if you could get a cheap surrogate to pop out. And very often it would be accurate. You could train it well, um, but um, without a massive amount of data, you couldn't use it. The, the model itself wouldn't be stable. So it would either extrapolate poorly or depending on how you set it up, it might, um, it might give you an ill-posed prediction. So what's kind of emerged in the last few years are so-called physics and form machine learning ideas. And the idea with these is that you, you wanna regularize your traditional loss, right? Your, your mismatch between whatever this neural network architecture is you choose to work with in your data. You also add some sort of physics residual. So this might be a residual to a PDE. This might be penalizing a departure from a conservation structure. Uh, or so on. And what people have seen is that in these kind of um, scientific machine learning settings, that this alleviates these large data requirements. And you can start to realize some of the really exciting uh, potential about these machine learning tools. Um, these 
Tools though have their downsides. So this is just a penalization of physics. So you can only incorporate this to within optimization error. You have to choose how to weight these uh, penalty parameters and so on. So what we've been developing is what we're calling structure preserving machine learning. And by different strategies, the idea is that we want to enforce physics exactly, uh, either as an equality constraint or actually building it into the architecture itself. Um, and so the key thing that we're after is uh, architectures which are accurate, meaning as accurate as finite elements that you can do mesh refinement and it's guaranteed to converge and hopefully with a high order of convergence. And then also with guaranteed uh, stability and physical realizability guarantees. Um, and ideally this will be independent of the amount of data that you have. So even if you have one data point, you should get a model which is conservative, um, stable and so on. And our tools are going to be the tools from the, the PDE world and the traditional kind of numerical analysis idea or ideas. Uh, so the outline for today is first I'll just share, uh, this is just kind of some fun stuff, um, but some motivating applications uh, at the laboratories where, where we're interested in applying these kind of tools, just to give a sense of where our interests are. But the main idea is we're trying to, um, I'm breaking this talk up into two parts. So one focusing on how you can realize accuracy guarantees, and then a second piece um, focusing on how you can realize structure preservation and guaranteed stability. Um, so for each one of those, we have two different tools, one that we call partition of unity networks for accuracy, another one where we've built up this uh, data-driven exterior calculus, um, which lets us prove a lot of things about uh, structure preservation and stability. So I'll, I'll break in between. Um, I'm happy to take questions at any point, but as I switch between these sections, I'll, I'll pause and, and take questions for a few minutes. If um, uh, So don't, don't worry about holding things until the end. Okay. Uh, so first, what I'm going to share is a, a few of these uh, data-driven modeling exemplar problems that we've been using to kind of prompt, um, like, what, what are the actual guarantees that we need? So uh, Sandia is a very engineering-focused lab. We have these applications, and we kind of started with the applications and then reverse-engineered what is the properties that we need out of these architectures. So one problem that we're looking at is uh, radiation-hardened semiconductor design. So... Um, we do a lot of things for satellite components, things that go up into space. Um, and when you send a electrical circuit up into space, it gets bombarded with radiation. Um, and so a big question is how to incorporate uh, the degradation of circuits as they're bombarded with, with that radiation. So a given circuit isn't made up of individual semiconductor devices. And typically what people will do will solve the drift diffusion equations or, or PDEs, which describe um, which can incorporate radiation effects and they give a lot of the physics that, that are going on there. But of course, an actual um, design um, may have millions of these individual components. So what's historically done in the electrical engineering community is they will squint at this uh, PDE solution, they'll squint at experimental results, and they'll try and derive an equivalent circuit. So they'll say, oh, we've got positive ions here, negative ions there. We can maybe model that as a capacitor and so on. And empirically over the course of a decade, they'll come up with this equivalent circuit which responds um, in the same way as the actual uh, PDE, but it's, it's very cheap. So you can couple millions of these things together and it scales up to an actual device. So the problem is, you know, these are calibrated in terms of a nominal engineering environment and you can't take another decade to develop a new model once a device is up in space and radiation has altered the, the material effects here. So one thing that we're trying to do um, is automate this. So extract these kind of graph models from uh, high fidelity PDE simulation and hopefully you could get something automated where you can extract these kind of reduced order models in a matter of days or, or weeks. Um, a, a second data driven um, modeling exemplar problem that we're looking at um, is shock uh, magneto hydro experiments on the Z machine. So uh, the Z machine is, uh, I think it's just about like the coolest thing. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's an experimental facility at Sandia um, and it's a pulse power fusion, what's called a pulse power fusion device. So this big room, it's about the size of a, a big uh, ice hockey rink uh, is surrounded by maybe one story tall capacitors. So just absolutely massive batteries that are full of charge 
And then the, the aim of the device is to discharge all of these capacitors um, into a small um, region in the center of the room. And it, it's really no different from those disposable cameras where you, you charge it up and then you, you hit the button and you know for a camera, it makes a flash. For this, it's dumping enough energy into a small region that for a, a brief window of time, it creates a fusion environment. So it's not a fusion reactor, but it's an experimental device for probing high energy physics. Um, so one of the problem, one of the types of experiments that people do with this is they try and extract equations of state for materials um, under extreme conditions. Um, and so the way one of these experiments might work is you use the magnetic field that's generated by this machine to launch what's called a flyer plate. It's really just like a ballistic projectile into a material of interest. And then you get to observe how a shock will propagate through that material. So one thing that we're interested in doing is observing these kind of shock profiles and from those inferring what is an equation of state which could have generated that shock. So machine learning in this environment, what we'd like to use it for is as a cheap surrogate solution to the Euler equations and a way to rapidly solve inverse problems. But of course, like any discretization, right? You have to be very careful to get a good, a good discretization of the Euler equations, no different from finite elements. Um, so, um, so those are, those are some of the problems that we're looking at. We're, we're looking at a bunch, um, but I'm going to focus more on the actual tools we're developing today. Um, and so really, like I mentioned, what we're interested in is what needs to be done to augment these traditional machine learning tools um, so that we can apply them to these types of applications. And so this, the first part of this talk, what I'm going to focus on is how to build networks with convergence properties. And for these engineering problems, it's not enough to just make a, a cool picture in the eyeball norm. You need to be able to do some analog of like mesh refinement so that you know that you're actually looking at a true solution to the PD that, that you care about. And so when we got started in this, we're traditionally kind of approximation theorists and numerical PDE people. Um, we got our hands dirty with neural networks by just saying, okay, let's see how what kind of accuracy we can get out of this. And so we just tried silly tests like regressing uh, sine two pi x on the unit interval. And we were probably like many of you, um, very disappointed that, that the best you would get is some sort of convergence, like maybe 1% error, 0.1% error. And it was a little bit shocking that this was meant to be exciting, right? Because for finite elements, this, this is very subpar performance. And so there's all this folklore surrounding deep neural networks related to universal approximation theorem. And if you have infinite size networks, size data, all this stuff. That's kind of the, what's meant to say, it, people kind of sweep a lot under the rug, but of course that, that doesn't really tell you what's going on. So we started digging into the actual estimates of convergence rates um, that are going on. So people looking at things like, how does the truncation, the best approximation error of a network scale with width or depth or with data? And there's all the, these works that have emerged out of maybe the last five years looking at these different types of convergence. So we had this one paper where we kind of dug into all of this and what we wanted to do was not prove that there exists a neural network that converges at this certain rate, but we wanted to be able to realize it during training, which is something that you typically can't do. And so we tried to understand what these neural networks are actually doing, right? In, in the, the point of this paper is that you could see that you could partition a traditional multi-layer perceptron into a block of hidden layers and then a linear layer. And what that hidden layer is doing is it's discovering a, a Banach space. So it's finding uh, some collection of functions that you're going to take a linear combination of, right? So what would traditionally be like polynomial coefficient weights, um, that those are the learned weights for this linear layer. And what you can see over the course of training, this is sine x, sine y, uh, for a shallow network with a ReLU activation where these dashed lines are the, the hyperplanes for, um, for where the activation kicks in. You can see that it's really doing a sort of um, R refinement. It's pushing around the, the features that you've got so that you can get a best possible approximation out of this final layer. And so, uh, I'm kind of skipping to the punchline here, um, but uh, I think this kind of characterizes 
what we're after before we get into the details. So, so like I mentioned, if you just try and regress a, a simple function um, with an MLP, what you'll get is saturation, maybe around 1% error, 0.1% error. As the, the network stagnates during training um, due to getting stuck in sub-block, uh, sub-optimal local minimizers and, and so on, there, there's a lot of kind of discussion about why this is, but for whatever reason, um, we're not able to realize these, uh, these constructions from approximation theory, which say that neural networks should be able to realize the best possible nonlinear approximation, or you should be able to realize exponential convergence. And so the, the tricks that we've put together basically allow us to recover HP element type convergence or algebraic convergence rates with respect to the, the width of the network. And so this came out of these series of papers um, which culminated in, in this final one highlighted down here in red. Um, so I'll, I'll skip the details of the first one and, and kind of just go over the punchlines of this, but, um, but th this is kind of the body of work over the last year or so that led us to be able to, to get here. So, so the, the paper that really, um, this is one of my favorite papers from, um, from the machine learning world that, that Philip uh, was an author on. Um, and it really was eye-opening for us at least about how to think about what these things are actually doing. And the point is that they've established constructions that there exists a neural network, which is able, you know, a certain way of choosing weights and biases and so on, that are able to emulate a bunch of different types of approximators. And the, the one class of approximation that we really dug into was uh, HP approximation. And the idea behind this paper, which um, I'm, I'm not going to do it justice by going into any details, but just kind of hit these two main ideas, is they come up a way of emulating monomials with a deep neural network. You say you set the weights and biases just right so that you can, ex uh, to exponential uh, convergence in the error, uh, you can emulate a, a, a Taylor monomial. And then you're also able to emulate a piecewise polynomial space. So you're able to restrict that onto subdomains so that those polynomial, uh, those polynomials can be used to, for example, model the way that you can uh, do kind of Taylor series arguments in a traditional HP finite element method. Um, so the idea that we had was that we wanted to work with a partition of unity, which is of course, just a collection of functions each of which are positive and for any uh, given point um, will sum to one. And we would work with this as a way of getting at that, that kind of magic piece that they were able to um, construct, right? And so maybe many of us are used to seeing partitions in the form of, uh, for HP approximation as um, your partition could be a, a, a set of indicator functions on a mesh Right? So if these phi i's are actually indicator functions on each cell on a disjoint mesh, right, that'll partition up space. This little cartoon is of a three cell mesh on the unit interval. Right? And then you might try and use polynomials to approximate on each one of these subdomains. Um, that, that, is, that would be a traditional um, HP finite element space discontinuous piecewise polynomials. But the, there's a more general class or way of doing this where these partitions don't have to, their support um, doesn't have to be disjoint and they can overlap. And you can still build up the same kind of approximation by attaching polynomials onto each one of these uh, partitions. So the architecture that we've come up with is what we're calling a partition of unity net. And the main idea, it, completely inspired by Philip's paper is, um, is we'd like to be able to emulate partitions of unity and mon monomials, but rather than emulating them, why not just build them directly into the neural network? So the idea itself is very simple. Um, so the first thing you want to do is construct a partition of unity. And so you will take any sort of hidden layer here. Um, so the, the results in our paper look at uh, taking ResNets um, or RBF networks. There are certain benefits to each one, but this could be anything. This could be an autoencoder. This could be any kind of hidden layer you like. Um, and then 
you take a composition of it with a softmax at the end. And usually in machine learning, a softmax is used for modeling probability distributions, but probability distributions are a partition of unity. They do sum to one, right? So this guarantees that the output of any neuron sums to one and that it's positive. So that means that this, this black box here is a way of parameterizing any given partition of unity. And so then what we do is for each one of those partitions, we attach a, a polynomial space with unknown polynomial coefficients. And so th it doesn't have to be a polynomial space. It could be any Banach space. You could work with singular functions, all sorts of refinement, uh, whatever you'd like. It, it doesn't change the way it works. And then you sum all of those up in order to get your approximation y at a given input x. And so the thing that's really attractive about this is it admits a unique optimization strategy. So if you pretend the hidden layer uh, weights and biases are frozen, um, and you look at the loss if you're applying this to, to like a L2 loss, then what pops out is a weightedly square problem. And so you can solve just by solving a linear system, you can solve for the optimal polynomial approximation on each one of these partitions, right? And then you can take a step of gradient descent to update these hidden layer weights. And you can alternate back and forth like that. And so basically what that's doing is it's allowing you to move along the manifold of optimal approximations to the data. The polynomial's job are to approximate, the partition of unity's job are, are to localize that approximation and partition space. Um, so, so you can just kind of go back and forth. And it looks a lot like our refinement in a traditional finite element method, like adaptive finite elements. Of course, this is all black box. We never even see a mesh, right? This is all handled algebraically through the, the weights and biases of the neural network. So we have some kind of toy error estimates uh, that we've used to help guide the way we work with these things. I, I wouldn't call this to be any sort of deep result. It's kind of an immediate result of once you have polynom polynomial reproduction that, and you're working in L infinity, you can extract the best approximation over the, the support of each partition. So the, this is pretty classical. Um, but it, it gives some sort of design principles. So if you can find a partition of unity with compact support, then you will realize HP convergence for smooth functions. And so there, we explore those ideas in, in the paper to, to kind of guide uh, which method we might want. So to give a sense of how this works, I think a video is best to really get a sense. So this is trying to approximate this function, which is piecewise quadratic in 1D. This blue line is the approximation. And on the left here, we have a set of partitions, right? And of course, you can't approximate this with a finite element space unless you're able to, um, you know, by hand go in and come up with a bunch of mesh cells that um, that conform to, to these discontinuities in the, in the derivatives. So if you, if you let it evolve, you'll see that these partitions at first, they're, they're kind of exploring the space, they're helping the polynomials approximate things. But then there's this sort of phase transition where all of a sudden out pops what we would generate by hand, right? So there's no mesh generation here, but it's able to come up with a traditional finite element space. And so in these, these videos here, we're looking at piecewise, uh, like a sawtooth wave, piecewise linears, and this quadratic wave pictured here. And we're looking at scaling it so that the number of partitions in the network scale like the number of piecewise polynomial regions here. Um, and what we see is that as you scale up to many, many partitions, um, we're still able to maintain under 1% accuracy. Um, whereas if you throw a ResNet with the same sort of number of parameters, there's obviously a lot of uh, details there about how to make this a fair comparison. But you can see that a, a black box ResNet is able to, to do pretty, pretty well, like something like 1% error for a couple partitions, but it quickly loses its ability to, to find this many uh, fine scale features. Um, I, I left out the details where, um, where we're, I should skip back to this picture. So what, what this convergence plot corresponds to is using an RBF net for, for the uh, POU partition, which, is, uh, which gives you a continuous partition, but it's very easy to initialize. Um, and that was kind of critical for 
realizing um, algebraic convergence rates for smooth data. So, so this is looking at the function uh, sine 2 pi x sine 2 pi y with data sampled along the x and the y axis uh, so that it gives kind of like a, a low dimensional manifold, um, but the, the function you're actually trying to regress is smooth. So, th so there are these kind of questions, right? Like if you're trying, if your data is smooth, you can extract these kind of uh, uh, algebraic convergence rates. Of course, if you're working with something with discontinuities, which is much more realistic and a challenge for even finite element methods, right? We're, we're able to, you get something different. You, you make different design choices then. Um, so I'll maybe uh, take a second there and take some questions if, if there are any. I have definitely one question, um, but if anyone else has one first, or maybe you can use the time to type stuff in the chat while I ask this. Uh, so one of your theorems uh, required compact support. <laughs> then again, uh, you do this soft max, and I don't necessarily see why it would generate uh, partitions of unity with compact support. Um, yeah, so there, there are a lot of details in here about how we actually we have kind of a two-stage way of training this where we've been able, it, it's super empirical. We, we don't have any good reason to suggest it, but by penalizing the magnitude of the polynomial coefficients in this last layer, so we just added Tikhonov regularization onto that, that we've observed that that promotes sparsity. We've also done things like working with L1 norms, all, all sorts of things like that. In general, just throwing this into a L2 loss, there's no reason to think that you're going to get something compactly supported out. What's a little bit remarkable is you just do get that out at the end of training. So, um, you know, at this point, th these are very new results. I think th this is maybe the last three or four months. And we're pretty excited because we feel like this fills a niche, but this is lacking a lot of uh, theoretical uh, stuff underpinning it. So. In my perspective, there's a huge opportunity to figure out how to, you know, how to bridge that gap and show that you're able to get compactly supported domains. To me, it's kind of magical to just see them kind of um, over the right. course of training that they just kind of pop out. And are they usually like connected, the supports of the POUs that you get? Because I mean, so this is very per periodic. Um, it could happen that you learn just a partition of unity with two pieces of, I mean, periodic sure. support. Say, but so you'll, you'll actually see it in early training. Uh, it's kind of hard to see it here, but maybe this purple line and this green line, you get two partitions and they're, it's kind of like during early training, the, um, the partition of unity network is still trying to do some approximation. Right, so you can see that right here, the polynomials don't give a good fit yet. And so you get these kind of oscillating domains. And for lots of problems, what we've observed is um, you will get two partitions that kind of do everything. They're globally supported and all of the other partitions are close to zero. Mm. So there's a lot of the, those kind of things that, um, that are still pretty open-ended. Remarkably, we just tend to get these simply connected domains after training for a long time. I, we have no sense of that. We have looked at non-periodic functions. So a very simple one is taking this and just applying a, a scaling of the x-axis. So it bunches a lot of them up on the right-hand side. If it breaks the periodicity, it, it behaves the exact same way during training. So, um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of work to be done there still. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some questions in the chat. So the first one is whether the TensorFlow model of PoUNet is available on GitHub. It will be available soon. Please, if um, uh, please feel free to follow me. I, I guess on LinkedIn might be a, a place where we'll put it out when it's finished. I think Sandia, we have to review software before it goes out. Um, it is in a form which we can share and we will. So if it's been a month and you haven't heard anything, please feel free to send me an email and I'm, I'm happy to send you a link to the GitHub. 
All right. And another question is, what is the advantage of this over just adaptive FEM? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for the, the one place that I'm most excited about this is in high dimensional spaces, right? So if you're, if you start, if you do adaptive FEM, you have to start with the FEM mesh, which has to give you some sort of quasi-uniform partition of space, and you're destined to hit the curse of dimensionality, right? Whereas if, so for example, if you're doing uncertainty quantification, there are huge swaths of, of your space where there's nothing interesting going on. And that can be well approximated just by a constant, right? That it's maybe, it's equal to zero for a lot of the domain. You have like a probability measure that's concentrated in a, a small region. So for me, I, I think tying this to breaking the curse of dimensionality is the thing I'm personally most excited about. The, the, we all know that deep neural networks do break the curse of dimensionality, and we could hope that this will, this will give us an automated way in order to, to mesh high dimensional spaces. Um, there are all sorts of other things, right? Uh, like adaptive FEM, you have to have error estimators and things like that. In this case, we've only been exploring minimizing an L2 loss, but really you could minimize any loss you want, right? So you could imagine these kind of tailored like handcrafted bases um, that are popped that this can generate for you um, with no no kind of like pencil and paper analysis or error estimators or you know people do these like optimal um, transport ways of doing adaptive FEM you don't need any of that this just goes into TensorFlow and it pops out a basis so um, but yeah it, it's a good question it, it's a similar technology can I ask one more question and um, so you said that here you scale the number of terms that you've got in the partition of unity as the number of uh, piecewise linear regions. So mm -hmm. you kind of use a, a compatibility between the partition of unity and the problem. Have you experimented what happens if you've got, um, well, if you've got less regions, I guess you can't fit the function necessarily, but what happens with the optimization if you have a much more complicated model than you need if you've got 10 times as many uh, terms in the partition of unity. I see, yeah, so if you have, so yeah, it, it, that, that's very insightful. So for this problem, we've picked it, so we've got basically as many partitions as we need to regress this exact function. Um, we actually, I think it's either two times the partitions or four times the partitions than what we need. So this is slightly over parameterized, but not too much. Okay. If it is under parameterized, so you don't have as many partitions as you need to represent the data, then the partition of unity starts picking up the slack kind of in this picture here. It looks very similar, right? So you start seeing in a, a partition that isn't really partitioning space, it's trying to get some sort of approximation. So it kind of defaults back into working like a standard MLP in mm -hmm. a certain sense. Um, we haven't really explored like massively over parameterized things. So um, we've only seen this trend where we looked at this benchmark with two times, four times, eight times the partitions you need. And as long, and it seems to make a train better. Like it's easier to, to lock in to having a partition where you need it. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't do many tests in that direction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's one more question. I think after this, we should continue. Mm -hmm. um, so the last question is, why is the error not decreasing for the N partition uh, increasing in the quadratic wave test? Yeah, that would be very nice if it did. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if you had that, then it would be really incredible. And of course, with this, you know there exists kind of trivially, you, you know, it, it's not... You don't have to work as, as hard as, as Philip did in his paper, right? You can immediately see that there is a choice of partition, namely the indicator functions on each one of these intervals um, with a quadratic space in between where you can get this exactly. Um, and I'll say that we've been able to represent this exactly during training, but not consistently. So maybe one out of 10, just depending on how you initialize it, one out of 10 will actually get this to machine precision. Um, but you know, you're, it's a highly nonlinear space underneath the hood and 
this is still a deep neural network. So there are local minimizers that are suboptimal and, and so on. So this is maybe an encouraging step in the right direction, but it, it's not, it, it's definitely not curing all of, <laughs> so, so I wanna make sure I'm not over promising um, about what exactly this is doing, but but that, that would be nice. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, any other questions or can we move I think on? this were all, so you could move on. Maybe there are some more questions at the end of the, the talk. Sure, sure. I'm just gonna grab my phone so I can track the time. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move on to how we've been looking at structure preservation. Right, this is more geared toward actually discretizing PDEs. And so the tools that we use for this are um, compatible, what are called compatible spatial discretizations in a PDE world. And they're kind of like a more contemporary way of viewing discretization of PDEs that's tied to algebraic topology, um, differential geometry and exterior calculus. And the idea is that you're, you're setting everything up so that you're preserving some topological structure that are in the governing equations generally related to a generalized Stokes theorem. Uh, so the way these methods usually work are there's two ingredients. The first is a topological structure, and usually that would be a mesh that would be cells, faces, edges, and nodes with a boundary operator linking all of those together with the property uh, that the boundary operator squared is zero. So it gives you an exact sequence, and then a bunch of properties kind of descend from that. So our idea is we're going to use a graph as an inexpensive low dimensional surrogate and work with k cliques. So k cliques, k minus one cliques, k minus two cliques, and so on are also linked together through a boundary operator with that property. Um, and then the second piece for using this to approximate PDEs is metric information. And so usually that would be measures associated with these things, right? So volumes, areas, lengths, and so on. And so, you know, for example, we're all probably familiar with the finite volume method. You have this topological piece where you just sum up all of the fluxes, right? The, this is the topological ingredient. And then the metric comes in, in terms of these areas and these cell volumes. And that's what makes it actually converge to a divergence operator in this case, or any exterior derivative. And so graphs are purely topological. There is no metric information, right? They're just something to describe connectivity. And the idea behind this is we'll use machine learning to extract that, that missing metric piece and kind of flesh it out. And so, um, it would take a long time to actually go through this carefully. So I just want to give a flavor of it. So the, the main ingredients to, to this whole way of setting this up, at least for elliptic problems, is you start with a chain complex that would either be these mesh entities or these graph entities. Um, uh, they induce through the Stokes theorem what's called a co-chain complex, right? So for example, a graph gradient uh, is induced by the boundary between nodes and edges. Same thing as the divergence in the finite volume method is induced by the, the Gauss divergence theorem um, in between relating cells and the, the boundary faces. And then what's typically done is you use, you define a inner product space to induce a different operator as an adjoint to these co-boundary operators, right? So you, you start with this co-boundary, right? It might be a graph gradient you choose a inner product um, in the graph calculus is maybe the little L2 inner product and that induces an adjoint. So in that example, it would be the graph divergence operator. And um, so the, the piece that's missing, so we have all of this on a graph except for this inner product space. So we're gonna zoom into that and that's where we're going to add a parameterization and use some data in order to learn co-differential operators, right? And so, um, these commuting diagrams are kind of a mess if you haven't seen them before, but what we have in the bottom is all of this graph calculus, graph, uh, grad, curl, div, um, their adjoint operators and so on. So the, this kind of center chunk is the traditional graph calculus. And now what we've done is we've introduced these trainable um, metric tensors, which kind of uh, upgrade the graph calculus, right? So these are the way we're parameterizing these inner products are as diagonal matrices with positive entries. And so you can inherit all of the exact sequence properties of the graph calculus, but now you can calibrate these, 
these vector calculus operations so that you can train them with data. And so that might just seem complex, but it gives you something very concrete. So um, that gives you something which is locally and globally conservative in terms of the relevant differential forms. It gives you guaranteed invertible Hodge Laplacians, um, which are symmetric positive definite. Um, and then it gives you this exact sequence property for these operations, which are really critical for handling the non-trivial null spaces that pop up in electromagnetism. And, and that's why, at least for my group, that this is what we're focused on. So this is a necessary thing if you're going to be handling plasma physics, electromagnetics, and, and so on. So uh, you know there are theorems to back all this stuff up. I won't go through it. I'll just point out, you know, we have these exact sequences, we have the Hodge decomposition. We have a Poincaré inequality for the associated Hodge Laplacians. And that's what lets you prove that you have invertible Hodge Laplacians. So all, all of the proofs are, are in this paper here. Um, but but I, I'll just very concretely say how you're meant to, to use this. So um, something very simple, say you want a surrogate for the Darcy equation. You, it's written in first order form. The first equation is the conservation statement. You're not allowed to play with that. That is physics and there's no machine learning to be done there. And that's the topological piece of this exterior calculus, right? Then you have these fluxes, which are traditionally empirical. So this is where you want to inject data and, and learn something. And so the idea is um, we take our uh, high fidelity simulation, we coarse grain it for this, we just use Metis. There's, there's all sorts of things you can do in, in this piece. And then you extract a graph, which um, represents a coarse inversion of this geometry. And what you'd like to do is train this graph so that it reproduces the moments of this high fidelity simulation. And so in order to do that, once you have the graph, right, this is your chain complex, then you come in and you tailor these graph, you know, these learnable uh, graph divergence, because that's the analogous thing. The, you grab the graph gradient, but then you add a black box neural network flex. So you're able to basically learn a nonlinear perturbation of, of what, it, what ends up being a Hodge Laplacian. So the, the motivation for setting this up is that you have all of your conservation, um, all of this kind of very delicate algebraic structure that you have to be careful with. And then you, you zoom in, you're only putting a neural network where you're allowed to, where it's empirical and it won't break conservation. And at the end of the day, um, I, I won't go through this in detail, it's in the paper, but you're left with a model of this, of this form. So you have a nice invertible bilinear form. This is a Hodge Laplacian. It has a Poincaré constant associated with it, it's SPD. And then you have this nonlinear perturbation. And so now you can look at actually using equality constraint optimization to fit a model of this form to data, right? So train both the fluxes and this missing metric information in order to come up with a model that, that matches the, this kind of target surrogate information. And so you can prove, at least for this class of problems, we're, we're working on ones tailored better to um, uh, advection problems rather than these kind of second order elliptic systems, but, but you can prove that this PD constraint is well posed so that it has a unique solution. And, and this is super classical. This is in any kind of PD textbook. As long as you can show that you've got enough ellipticity coming from this bilinear form to control the nonlinearity, uh, just in terms of, so, so it's basically just the ratio of the Poincaré constant to the Lipschitz constant uh, of that, um, of the nonlinearity. And so you could enforce this as a constraint during training if you wanted to. We, we tend to, we just check this uh, condition and note that it's actually satisfied. Um, but, but just to say, you can pretty trivially estimate this Lipschitz coefficient just in terms of the number of weights, the, the width, the depth, the activation function, uh, just working in the L infinity norm. So what you can do now is you can just use traditional PDE constraint optimization. There's no PDE, this is a graph operator, but um, right, so you can, you start with a random initialization of the network. You solve the forward problem for W and U. You solve an adjoint problem in order to get um, these Lagrange multipliers and put you um, on the manifold where uh, of, um, of solutions where the constraint is satisfied. And then what you can do is you can just take a step of gradient descent. So we just do atom here and that tweaks your model and steers it toward a better fit to the data. And then you just kind of repeat this iteratively. And so, um, let's see how we're doing for time. 
I'll probably I'll, I'll skip through the results and just say that this um, this actually converges. It's guaranteed to be stable. This is comparing to a Darcy solver with the same number of degrees of freedom as the number of um, as the number of partitions that we work with, and you can see that. Um, you get much more accurate answers. Of course, you have to train this on a high fidelity solution, but um, the surrogate gives you uh, much better accuracy. So for example, like a five by five grid gives you pretty much just as good as what a, a fully resolved forward simulation would do. You can learn nonlinear operators. So this is what's called a five spot problem where you have a source, you have a sink, you have some sort of inclusion, right? But we're going to kind of cook up this fake nonlinear problem where the inclusion scales proportional to the, the potential drop across this device, right? And, and you can see that the surrogate um, is able to give you that. Um, but probably the most interesting thing is that this maps onto magnetostatic. So for this problem, you're solving curl curl U is equal to F, which has a non-trivial null space. So um, if U solves curl curl U equals F, then U plus grad phi also solves that um, for any phi. So, um, so the thing is, is that we're being very careful in kind of preserving all this algebraic structure in order to be able to handle that. There's a lot of details there that I'm glossing over, but the surrogate that you get out is exactly divergence free. It handles jumps in the material interfaces without introducing um, oscillations. It conserves circulation and it has all these guarantees so that you can use this in kind of like a traditional, you could embed this in an engineering workflow and know that it's not going to make your code blow up. So I have a little example of how I mentioned the semiconductor problem that we're doing before. So, so what we're doing is you start with this high fidelity drift diffusion PDE. You do some, there's some, there's some fun stuff that you can do here with spectral graph partitioning in order to get a really good partition of your high fidelity simulation. That gives you this graph surrogate. And then you can push this through and, and out pops a model which is able to reproduce um, in an integral sense, kind of the Dirichlet de Neumann map of this device. So it gives you this little out pops at the end of this um, kind of, you turn the crank out pops a surrogate model for a component that you can couple to, to other things. And so th this lets you actually automate this process which traditionally took 10 years of ele electrical engineers kind of um, empirically developing these by hand. I have some other results about this kind of hyperbolic problem stuff. Um, I think maybe I will skip through it. Um, but other, other than just to say, there are, this is another area where you can do, um, you can incorporate ideas from discretization, right? You'd like a neural network solution in this example to the Euler equations, but you need thing, you need to be careful with it. Like, you need it to be conservative to get correct shock speeds. Uh, you need to be careful to get the physically realistic entropy solution. All these things that you care about in traditional discretization, you care about here. And so in, in, this, in this work, what we've been able to do is um, kind of close the gap between traditional CFD simulations for Euler's equation um, in order to learn these equations of state. And so the, maybe the interesting takeaway here, just because we've kind of seen this broadly hold for a bunch of the, the work that we've done, um, is that once you incorporate these kind of physics constraints, so let, let, let me pause, pause for a second, slow down. So, so what we're looking at in this problem is we have some observation of a shock propagating through a material, and we'd like to fit an equation of state to it. Um, and so you can say that equation of state is like a black box neural network, or you could say that, um, or you could say that, oh, it's an ideal gas equation of state and I'm just going to estimate a single parameter, right? And turn it into a parameter estimation problem. Um, I think I pointed backwards for those. But what, what ends up happening is if you use a black box equation of state, the resulting uh, thing that you get out causes the Euler equations to lose their hyperbolicity and you get an ill-posed problem. So embedding these kind of like physics and form constraints is kind of critical to getting something useful at the end of the, at the, end of the day. So kind of rush through all of that, but um, may, maybe I will leave it there and, and take some more questions. Mm -hmm.